Thank you. I'm delighted to be asked to speak at this conference and for the chance to hear approaches to the studio home, which holds such promise for scholarship and new interpretations. And my warmest thanks are due to Sarah Turner and Valerie Ballant for their invitation to take part and to the warm hospitality of the Paul Mellon Center. As an architectural historian, I'm preoccupied primarily with the physical fabric of the studio. But my interest in it is not just as an architectural genre, but also in the studio as an inhabited place. The women I'm going to look at this afternoon, Gluck, Eileen Agar, and Dora Gordeen, were very different kinds of artists. They didn't exhibit together and moved in entirely separate circles. To discuss them together may seem rather odd, but they are women rooted in their time and place, 1930s England. This social and generational context is the key, I think, to understanding their way of life and the importance, the particular importance, which architecture held for all three. The more celebrated writers of the 1930s, the so-called Auden generation, famously chafed at the parochialism, the littleness of interwar England, and yearned to escape abroad. Alison Light's book, Forever England, looked instead at the period's middle-brow literature, especially that written by women. The novelists she considers, people like Daphne du Maurier and Agatha Christie, have a rather different focus. Their heroines manage and organize. There's, I quote, an increased consciousness of the materiality of domestic life, of home as the place of things, things that need buying, cleaning, moving, and maintaining. And this enhanced sense of the physicality of home is what distinguishes the studio environment of this period from what precedes it. It's helped, of course, by developments in illustrated journalism. The tradition of writing about artists at home, which followed the expansion of the illustrated press at the end of the 19th century, was augmented by the arrival of the gossip column in 1926. While the society pages in weekly publications like The Sketch encourage close scrutiny of clothes, manners, and environment, they help recast the image of the modern woman as someone concerned with the home, either her own or, sometimes more altruistically, involved in things like housing reform. The three artists I'm considering, all born in the 1890s, whatever they later claimed, operated in this world and used the publicity generated by their social position to great advantage. Significantly, they are more than just architectural patrons. All three were fascinated by architecture, all used it in ways which shaped the perception and understanding of their art. And their studios will, I hope, support this conceptual frame. We begin with the artist Gluck, who was rediscovered at the recent exhibitions at the Tate, Queer British Art, and also at Brighton Museum a couple of years ago. Gluck, born Hannah Gluckstein in 1895, belonged to a prominent Jewish family who'd made a fortune from a chain of tea shops, the Lions Tea Shops, and hotels. Gluck trained at St. John's Wood School of Art and was given a solo exhibition at the Fine Arts Society's Mayfair Gallery in 1926. By this stage, she had dropped her forename and abbreviated her surname. The exhibition contained landscapes, Cornish landscapes, 
and paintings of the glittering reviews at the Trocadero restaurant. These slickly painted images and Gluck's self-portrait on the left suggest the debonair observer of modern life. But for the camera, Gluck adopts the costume of a country squire. The exhibition coincided with the marriage of Gluck's brother, Louis. To compensate for his generous marriage settlement, her father bought Gluck a house in Hampstead, Bolton House, built in the 1730s, just opposite Romney's house on Windmill Hill. The life which Gluck made there with a housekeeper, maid and cook, saw a fascinating recasting of her artistic persona. Gluck deplored the fact that her mother had relinquished a promising musical career after marriage. She also resented the family fund, which was run by the senior males of the family, which provided her with an income, but retained control of her capital. Gluck's new home registers her criticism of these things. The playwright and poet Joanna Bailey had lived there in the 1800s. It's a house redolent of pre-Victorian habits, uh, sorry, patterns of sociability, less rigid attitudes to gender roles, and a concern with nurturing individual sensibility. The architect Edward Morfe and his wife Prudence helped renovate the house. The south-facing panelled rooms were painted white and arranged with polished furniture, ceramics and silver. Homes and Gardens magazine described ivory-coloured porcelain, iridescent shells and alabaster vases displayed against pale walls. This exquisite decor provided an environment far removed from the over-furnished houses where Gluck grew up. It also banished the spectre of the cafes and hotels which generated the wealth to pay for it. At first, Gluck used a uh, stable building behind the house to paint in. This was demolished in 1931 when Morph designed a new studio. Separated from the house by a formal garden, this took the form of a brick pavilion with a columned porch. To give the studio the form of a garden pavilion might appear a rather conservative choice on the part of architect and client, but it alludes to the iconic temple of friendship behind Natalie Barney's 18th century house in Paris, a meeting place for women of letters. Gluck's connection with Barney was via the painter Romain Brooks, with whom she had a brief affair. This new studio provided Gluck with a place for the exercise of talent, both musical and artistic. Here she could claim her own territory, a non-familial space where new modes of being an artist could be rehearsed. Conceived as a te temple of love, as well as a working studio, where this lesbian artist could entertain away from the inquisitive gaze of her servants. Flawed in oak, containing a grand piano, it was a place to indulge the senses, hearing, sight, touch, and smell from the magnificent flower arrangements supplied by Constance Spry, Gluck's lover in the 1930s. The interior, described as completely modern and efficient, contained an enormous studio lit by, rooms, by windows at the north end. At the south was a gallery containing a bedroom. Beneath, screened by partitions, was a bathroom and compact kitchen. It was designed to be kept free of clutter with built-in bookshelves and a rack for canvases. This spare but stylish aesthetic incorporated metal windows, steel and glass, as well as simple classical features Walls were painted a subtle tone of broken white, the epitome of chic. The photo on the right in Homes and Gardens showed things familiar to any reader of Trilby. A turkey rug on a polished floor, 
a divan bed ready for a model, a deep armchair and a stove. These suggestions of relaxation and sensuality, the romantic trappings of the artist's life, are contained within the framework of a beautifully proportioned, fashionably decorated room. References to art making are highly formalized, the palette, the easel, the pot with brushes. Interestingly, Gluck and Mork morph absorbed ideas from each other. The stylized concrete water lily you can see in the long pool on the left, which formed a water inlet for the garden pond, celebrates Gluck's flower paintings. <laughs> Morphs designed for rainwater heads, decorated with the date and the initial G, and the crisply detailed porch columns, now in a slightly dilapidated state, have the elegance and precision of Gluck's paintings. And for her part, Gluck encouraged Morph to embrace a greater simplicity in his other architectural work. During the 30s, Gluck was persuaded by Spry to wear Schiaparelli evening culottes. She refashions her image as an elegant androgyne rather than the tweedy figure who greeted journalists at the opening of her exhibition. In her studio, as in her dress, Gluck struck a balance between the persona of the raffish artist and the sartorial conventions of the social milieu she frequented. Her sexual and artistic identity rest on this synthesis of clubbish comfort and formality, unsettling preconceptions about studio life, challenging ideas of what a modern artist looked like. And an exhib the exhibition at Brighton included a fascinating display of Gluck's clothing. Spry introduced Gluck to a rich, smart set, including Lady Mount Temple, the Chatelaine of Broadlands, and Lord Vernon, owner of a neo-Georgian house in Chelsea. Sometimes Gluck and Spry worked in tandem. Just as Spry's grand floral arrangements were carried out in situ, Gluck was commissioned to paint flower pictures for specific rooms and locations, including Vernon House on the left. Spry absorbed Gluck's sensitivity to color, scale, and texture while Gluck was profoundly influenced by the way Spry related flowers, container, and room. This concept of paintings as part of an integrated ensemble during this decade was not new. As Andrew Stevenson has shown, during the slump years, distinctions between gallery, shop, and home were eroded somewhat as department stores included paintings Along displays, alongside displays of furniture. At the Fine Arts Society in 1932, Gluck devised an installation which divided the walls into bays with a raised plinth and pilasters and enclosed her canvases in simple white painted stepped frames. It's a fusion of modernist simplicity and what Peter Mandler has called the high fashion Georgianism of the period. Women's writing in the 30s was marked by its control, absence of gush, and a re renunciation of the language of romantic express expressiveness. Unlike Gluck's very volatile relationships with her family and friends, her approach to painting was highly controlled. Her technique becomes increasingly meticulous. The Bolton House studio's little kitchen doubled as a painter's workshop. Here begins a growing concern with materials. Starting in 1937, Gluck embarks on a campaign to improve the quality of artists' canvases and paints, what she called a paint war, pursued at the expense of her own work as an artist. It begins the year after the election of Laura Knight as Royal Academician and was perhaps the counterpart to Knight's long battle for, pro for professional recognition. Gluck's dedicated to this cause was characteristic of the modern woman's voice in the 30s, 
consistent with the quiet competence which provided them with a new public persona. She paid tribute to the material and spiritual support which her studio provided her with, writing to Morph in 1932 in a touching letter, saying that its simplicity and beautiful proportions had influenced her profoundly. My next artist, Eileen Agar, by contrast, has a much more irreverent attitude to architects and architecture. The studio she commissioned, more uncompromisingly modern than Gluck's, was gradually adapted and, and customised by the artist herself. In Agar's memoirs, she recalled with amusement that it was instrumental in her identification as a surrealist. Agar was born in Argentina, where her father worked a owned a company, Agar Cross, importing agricultural machinery. After his retirement in 1911, the family settled in England. Agar's wealthy parents seemed to have envisaged no occupation for their daughter apart from marriage, but allowed her to attend art school, first by M. Shaw's, then Leon Underwood's, and the Slade. There she met Rodney Thomas, who, bored with his architecture course at the Bartlett School, slipped into drawing classes next door at the Slade, which he enjoyed far more. Agar inherited a large annuity on her father's death, and in 1930, she asked Thomas to remodel two apartments in Bramham Gardens, Earl's Court. One was a studio flat for herself. The other, immediately above, was for her partner, the writer Joseph Bard. Agar, like Bard, had escaped from an unsatisfactory marriage. Agar's to a fellow student lasted only a year. She and Bard were wary of cohabiting. They aspired to maintain what she called the right porcupine distance in their living arrangements. Thomas's compact design suggested mobility and modernity. Agar described his vision as rationalization, liberation from ornament, concentration on concise and economical solutions. What also emerges is a sculptural approach to form and a rather inventive use of materials and textures. Bard's flat contained a cabin-like bed sitting room with built-in cupboards with rather curious peg-like handles. Agar's flat, containing larger, higher rooms, combined sitting room with studio. The architectural press hailed them for conveying a new sense of order and precision. But there were also some rather unsettling aspects. The studio is dominated by a huge lamp of the kind used for op operating theatres in hospitals. A clock above the fireplace had a chrome-plated concave face pierced with Roman numerals. It, the numbers are illuminated by a concealed wall light, and the light radiating from the circumference of the clock makes it appear to float freely of the wall. A dark circle painted round it makes it resemble an eyeball, its iris formed by the clock face, and it complements the domed ceiling light, which looks like a half-closed eyelid. Reflections in the clock face and the rather wave-like patterns of the marble fireplace surround added to the mysterious aspects of this room. Agar's dining room on the left, overseen by the figure of St. Joseph from a French junk shop, had a veneered worn-out table, whose surface she described as akin to a thunderstorm. Her bedroom was dominated by a giant mahogany wardrobe, which resembled a room within a room. Paul Nash, her lover, dubbed the wardrobe Fortress Agar, and Miss mischievously suggested that she used it to conceal her other lovers inside. The dressing table on the opposite corner of the room is linked by a series of undulating curves of a mirror. Rather oddly, a journalist connected this luxurious bedroom 
to the effects of the slump, writing of the post-crisis doctrine of simplicity and economy, which go hand in hand with efficiency, unquote. This rather positive take on the economic crisis of the early 30s is not shared by Agar and Bard. In 1931, they produce a magazine called The Island, its title evoking not Robinson Crusoe, but the magical domain of Prospero. It offered a critique of the industrialized spirit of the age, suggesting that creativity and imagination were being crushed. And this conflicted attitude to modernity registers, I think, the introversion of the day, the government's campaign to buy British in 1931, and the studio magazine's criticism of um, deracinated artists, suggesting that they should depict their native land. Agar's flat is gradually transformed during the 30s. Around the clock, she wrote, I made a collage of images. Other objects were constantly changing. I was collecting, storing, surrounding myself with source material. The decor changed like the sea rack cast up by the tide. It was instrumental in her inclusion in the International Surrealist Exhibition in London in 1936. Roland Penrose and Herbert Reed, hunting for exhibits, had been directed to her studio by Paul Nash. Besides the collage round the clock, they found the front door decorated to suggest a face, with the letterbox a mouth, a hand as the nose, eyes and hair made of twisted ironwork. Agar showed three paintings and five objects in the exhibition. Being identified as a surrealist was, she admitted, a very good way of being of attracting attention as an artist. But the society pages and gossip columns also took note. A photograph shows her, published in the papers, shows her winding up the clock. Her flat, conceived as a riposte to the richly furnished bourgeois home of the period, privileged compact living over a splendid home and possessions, sexual freedom and creativity over marriage and children. In its customized state in the early 30s, it suggested other things too, a parody perhaps of the contemporary cult of efficiency and scientific homemaking, but also perhaps of the glamorous interiors featured in the society papers. Agar's bathroom was described by a journalist as containing a length of rope a propeller, a chart, and a life belt with a toy swan mounted on a bath Oliver biscuit, which is a kind of cracker to eat with cheese. A different kind of parody is suggested in her ceremonial hat for eating bouillabaisse, which she made out of an inverted cork soup plate and decorated with seaweed and a lobster tail inspired by her mother's elaborate Edwardian hats. There's a wonderful parfait film of her wearing it walking down Kensington High Street in the 1940s. I think it may have sustained some rain damage and she then had to remake it and that's the state in which it now resides in the v &A. Penrose and Reed described Agar's flat as a kind of grotto bower or Aladdin's cave and its occupant as possessing, I quote, a highly sensitive imagination and a feminine clairvoyance, unquote. A photograph of Agar at her work table with her white cat might seem to support this, but as well as disrupting the clean lines of her studio with the messiness of a working artist, the photograph also suggests her firm grip upon her own image. It shows the artist's face and hands flooded with light as she touches one of a pair of giant plaster hands. The effect was to underline Agar's creative power and her artistic agency. 
We come finally to the sculptor Dora Gordine, and I'm delighted that Helena Bonnet is here and delighted by her reference to uh, Dorich House and hope that this may inspire some of you to visit it, uh, time permitting. After her death in 1991, Gordine's house near Richmond Park was bought by Kingston University, and the curator began to unravel Gordine's extraordinary trajectory between her birth in 1895 in Latvia, then part of the Russian Empire, and her marriage in 1936 to the British aristocrat, the Honorable Richard Hare. Gordine was always extremely evasive about her origins and family, claiming rather inaccurately that her family had fallen victim to the Bolsheviks. She presented herself to journalists in a way which conformed to the image of the woman of the 30s. Professionalism, hard work, she claimed 16 hours a day, and methodical techniques. She emphasized her Russian roots. Her passionate, vigorous dedication to art evokes Anna Pavlova and the Ballet Russe, perhaps, rather than English reticence or control. As a sculptor, her requirements for space were more substantial than those of Gluck or Agar. She needed space to display her work as well as to produce it. She'd had prior experience of building in Paris in the 20s and in Malaya, where she went to create sculpture for Singapore's municipal buildings and where she married an English doctor. After returning to Europe in 1935, Gore decides, Gordine decides to make a life with Richard Hare. On the strength of a legacy from his deceased father, the Earl of Listowel, they decided to build a house where they could live and work. Now, in the 1930s, Soviet artistic culture was attracting a good deal of attention here. The architect Lubetkin and sculptor Gabo were among the Russians who settled in England. Their work was featured in the anthology Circle in 1937, and parallels between the sculpture and the architecture it featured are close, smooth, undecorated planar surfaces, hovering forms, concrete and steel helping to create buildings light on their feet. Circle referred, interestingly, to constructive art rather than constructivism, and it wished to emphasize that this was an artistic rather than a political revolution. Inevitably, though, it was closely identified with the Soviet regime. By contrast, Gordine identifies herself with a different Russian culture, that of the pre-revolutionary era. Her own sculpture was figurative, strongly patinated, generally cast in bronze, and suggests a quite different kind of relationship with architecture. Intriguingly, Gordine and Hare contemplated employing one of Lubetkin's assistants, Godfrey Samuel. His designs for their studio house articulated separate zones for making and displaying sculpture. This one had a cylindrical core containing a ramp which connects the two volumes. Its brutal geometry and concrete walls did not endear it to the owner of the proposed site in North London. More seriously, Gordine found the architect unwilling to listen to her. A new plot was secured in southwest London, and Gordine herself assumes control of the design, with a building contractor providing drawings and technical expertise. She said she began with the interiors. The house, which Gordine and Hare christened Dorich House, amalgamating their forenames, included studios, a gallery, and living space. The ground floor had service rooms, as you can see, a study for hair, a plaster studio, and a garage. Ascending to the first floor, the flow of space offered an exhilarating experience. The plan allowed vistas across a staircase hall between the gallery and the main studio. Lighting was very carefully considered. 
in the studio, long windows behind the model stage augment the flood of light from the north window. In the south-facing gallery, there was an oculus, long windows, and trios of windows to the east and west. The surfaces of the sculpture on display ranged from the a la boulette technique she used in the 1920s to a more robust texture created by cross-hatching, thumbprinting, and tooling of the original clay, with light catching its facets when cast. The texture was enhanced by colour tinting, chosen according to the gender and personality of the sitter. The first floor provided a controlled viewing experience in which visitors move through space to see sculpture in a sequence of rooms lit as the sun moved around the building. Above, in the living quarters of Gordine and Hare, lunette windows were set low in the walls to reduce glare. Light was filtered through the branches of the great trees and the park, uh, great trees of the park and the gardens nearby. Between dining room and sitting room were sliding doors of Malayan hardwood set into a three-quarter circle opening, the so-called moon doors. The sitting room opened onto a terrace above the apsidal end of the gallery. Above, the flat roof of the house served as open-air studio, outdoor living space, and sleeping balcony. The spare detailing, ribbed brickwork, and blind brick arcades create a rather forbidding aspect. Their solid forms and simple massing evoke Byzantium. This is not accidental. Gordine and Hare were friendly with the travel writer Robert Byron, who opened English eyes to the artistic legacy of Eastern Europe. In his, first, in his book, First Russia and Then Tibet, 1933, Byron wrote of the importance of colour in architecture and of the sensory nature of architectural experience. Elsewhere, he criticised the drab functionalism of the modern buildings he'd seen in the Soviet Union. Byzantine architecture he regarded as the, I quote, intellectual, more three-dimensional tradition of architecture. So it's solid, it's massy. It's sculptural. He also admired English Georgian architecture, a taste he shared with Richard Hare. And Dorich House is in some ways indebted to the picture gallery at Dulwich. The motif of arched openings framed with arched openings, delineated in a simple groove surround, connects it with the enfilade of top-lit galleries at Dulwich on the left. Appreciation of sewn accompanies the new taste for simplicity during the 1930s. The article in the sketch conveys the eclecticism of the house's contents and its curious blend of Russian and English traditions. A contemporary photograph showing Gordine with hair presiding over a samovar on the roof terrace conveys the complex, nex complex nexus of allegiances which this house contained. An alternative vision of the Russian, different, therefore, from that in circle, an embrace of landscape, a love of brick. Its modernity lies in its provision for open-air living, its garage and its tennis court, its mechanisms for bringing food up from the kitchen via a hoist, and transporting materials and sculpture between the upper and the lower studios. Over time, the house's identity shifts rather interestingly. We find Hare's Regency furniture and paintings being gradually edged out by the collection they'd formed together of Southeast Asian art and furnishings. And then, after the Second World War, as Hare's interest in Russian literature deepened, he becomes a professor um, of Russian literature it, at, at the University of London and is a, a very um, distinguished translator of Russian uh, novels and plays. 
At this point, a collection of Russian imperial art was introduced. Um, sadly, not very much of that remains. It was sold to defray the costs of restoring the house in the 1890s, but just a few objects were kept. In this period, too, Dorich House assumes a new significance as a kind of bastion of figurative sculpture, this older tradition, in an era which was increasingly dominated by Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth's monumental abstract sculpture. The architect Wells Coates wrote in 1938, I quote, we get rid of our position, of possessions, and we find a new and exciting freedom, unquote. And the Kensington studio flat, which he created uh, from an older house, an Edwardian uh, building in Yeoman's Row, offered a seductive image of a streamlined work and living space apparently uncluttered by domestic paraphernalia, although I think it is actually tucked underneath um, this raised, the mezzanine floor uh, at the bottom right of the image. But the workplaces we've seen, the serene temple of Gluck, the melee of images of Agar, the conservative exoticism of Gordian's house, serve to complicate that image of a modern studio. But while jettisoning Edwardian clutter, these women did not repudiate the domestic, but propose alternative versions of it. Interestingly, they play in different ways with ideas of efficiency, sometimes, as in Agar's case, burlesquing it. One form which this, their assumption of control took was an active role in the design process. Very interesting at a time when um, the profession of architecture was, as it were, um, arming itself and raising its profile because of the systematization of architectural education. It became um, part of the syllabus of universities, university schools of architecture, and thus very much bolstered the image uh, and um, position and authority of the trained architect. So these women collaborated with, in important ways, modified, or as in Gordian's case, assumed complete control of the design process. Herbert Reed had some rather interesting things to say about domesticity in his essay, Why the English Have No Taste, published in 1935 in the French journal Minotaur, but republished in the Listener magazine um, in 1936. I don't think it was broadcast, but it was published in English. It provides a sort of coda for my paper. According to Reed, the English obsession with money and their puritanical attitude to art was evident nowhere best but in their homes. While enjoying the material benefits of capitalism, England paid dearly in the degradation of the physical environment, both in the home and outside it, and in what Reed called a death of the spirit, unquote. Rather interestingly, as Reed wrote, the surrealist project, his project, was being underwritten by individuals who had inherited considerable wealth from their capitalist fathers and grandfathers. Individuals like Roman Penrose, Edward James, Eileen Agar, Leonora Carrington. Reed probably enjoyed the irony that the wealth of English capitalists was being used to remedy what he saw as the damage inflicted on the national psyche. That's just an aside. But Reed's focus on the physical environment as an <coughs> index of a society's value is very interesting. I quote, it is only in the English home 
the Englishman's castle, that the full horror of the neurosis will be revealed, he wrote. He identified that neurosis as the su suppression of instinct, great prudishness, and complete indifference <coughs> to art. His essay underlines the centrality of the domestic to interwar English culture. In this arena, it seemed perhaps possible to launch a challenge to the status quo and thus subvert tradition from within, <coughs> a place where daughters could ex exact a subtle revenge upon the environment of their parents, or in Gordian's case, perhaps, that of her parents-in-law. Certainly, we 
um, experienced that, I think, yesterday at Charleston House. <laughs> even though, you know, there's even among those of us who are coming at it from perhaps that art historical perspective, you can't help but some of that to go on. And I'm, I'm struck by some of these photographs. You know, we have very few um, relative, um, I don't know if it's the same here, um, preserved homes from mid-century on, um, you know, only have a handful. And certainly those of the Park Avenue, Cutis, George L.K. Morris, and Susie Friedlingheisen were highly photographed and highly stylized in the way that you um, those images really resonated with me. But likewise, um, as early as, I want to say, 1875, Frederick Church's Olano was being um, published with, Im with Im engraved images, the interiors as aspirational, um, in a whole series on um, artistic and creative spaces, including artists and writers, and I think that's sort of a very interesting thread that probably deserves more examination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, Judy, oh. yeah. Yeah. Judy Cadell in her book on artists' life writings does look at um, magazine images in, in magazines as well as in uh, biographies and so on, autobiographies. Uh, and I think she goes up to 1900, or perhaps even 1910, um, and she talks about, about also the importance of techniques of reproduction, you know, the, the you know, ability to reproduce cheaply photographic images, not just um, drawings, engravings, and so on, but photographs, so giving you that kind of real feeling that you are. I just wanted to add to that actually, of course there is also the phenomenon of the studio photograph and artists who are you know, working with professional photographers yes. um, and you mentioned Marcuse earlier yes. and of course, yes. um, Picasso does this, Moore does this, so you know, um, professionally staging the studio and um, the narrative that that gives about, you know, yes. whether it be a hands-on artist or whether yes. it be a sort of very, like, yes. there are perhaps more fiction um, yes. than authenticity yes. somehow yes. in this. Yeah. Yes, interesting. I mean, Brancusi um, mostly himself produced the photos of his studio. Um, very rarely did he allow reproduction of photos by other people of that space. So, you know, he's completely in control. Not only does he set up the image, but he, he takes it as well. And there are a number of artists who follow, well, Rodin works with photographers, doesn't, as far as I know, take photos himself. But in this country, um, the artist Effie McWilliam, um, who was uh, a contemporary of Moore, um, is a very good photographer. And he very much emulates Brent Cousy in kind of setting up his studio and sort of underlining its place as really a kind of evolving space of making art. Uh, it's not, you know, they're not highly formalized at all. It's, it's, they're very inventive, indeed. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you a bit more about, if you could talk a bit more about the Agar studio walls, yes. these yes. collage walls. I thought that, yes. And I wonder um, yes. what more immediate, what were the immediate models for that kind of practice in Agar? And, and, and how yes. do you see it emerging out of a longer tradition of artists having different kinds of imagery <coughs> on their walls as points of reference yes. or inspiration yes. or French or gift giving well, and so on? I, mean, or, 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 yeah. I just, I'm very intrigued by yeah. that trajectory. Uh, what kind of models? Maybe, oh, sorry, I'm speaking to this. I would think probably Max Ernst, um, who was exhibiting in London in the 30s. Agar had been in Paris at the end of the 20s, uh, studying with a cubist, a Czech cubist called Fontine. 
And she said she, she met the Sorelis, but um, it didn't affect her work. You know, she knew them because she could speak French, and they socialized together well, I wonder. Um, she, uh, yeah, interesting that, 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 you know, habit of artists, you know, the pin board and mm -hmm. the, the sticking things up. Oof, um, interesting that it, it, um, it has parallels with what she does to her clock. I mean, I find it interesting that she's kind of really expunging the, the cleanliness and the rather sort of clinical aspects of what a, you know, started off as this sort of perfect modernist studio design. Um, and the way that it becomes, if you like, a kind of catalyst for her production, actually, if you look at her work in the 30s, which is uh, predominantly collage. I mean, she does make three-dimensional things. She does uh, make costume. Uh, she does do some oil painting, but they're predominantly collage. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. She's, <coughs> she's using it as both source material, but as a kind of way of, uh, a way of, um, Reversing the practice. Yes, yeah. actually. Yeah. Ah, yes. I mean, the, the comparison of collage is very confusing, but of course, there is a longer tradition again. And I, I wonder if uh, one of the things that, that, that seems to be coming out so interesting is these continuities between yeah. generations. And actually, I was just thinking of Leighton's studio, where we the opportunity to see it. <laughs> so he does, so he arranges, he has his um, his Michelangelo Tondo, he has his bit of the Parthenon for he's led into the wall, he has his, j just outside his own um, redrawing, repainting of Michelangelo Sistine ceiling, and he has rows and rows and rows of his own landscapes, which, which seem to be, um, you know, there as kind of, um, things that he might work with at some time. And these are all, of course, in the original yeah. studio, sort of yeah. combined together with all these kind of design That's inspirations. Yes. And then, of course, and, and then um, the smaller scale reproductions of bits of the of the Parthenon Frieze and Michelangelo's Night and Day and so forth. So, so the, I mean, this, this sort of surrounding yourself three dimensional with all of the things that you in, that inspire you. And, the, and, and it is as if, you know, everything's there to be sort of picked up. And I, I wonder whether that, that, that there is actually a bit more continuity between these generations, yes. despite the complete sort of change of look, which, yeah. which of yeah. course, and maybe one of the things that makes that change look yeah. so exciting is yeah. that it's a new interpretation of a, yeah. Of yeah. a, of a practice. Yeah. Like that. Absolutely. Yeah, um, interesting. Yes, and so um, despite the sort of anti-Victorianism which runs through the absolute period. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually, hmm. yes, maybe I'll go um, yeah, so it's sort of energized by your, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 squeeze one more question. I saw Marianne's hand at the back. Right there. No pressure, it took me the last question. I was just going to add to that because I think it's a very, very interesting point. And what I find myself thinking was, on the one hand, not just the parallel with Leighton and our British Victorians, but um, also if you look at uh, pictures or portraits of artists and studios, from the 1870s onwards, particularly in Paris, you will see that the walls are cluttered with all yes. sorts of yes. reference points. Yeah. It trophies. Be, you know, so trophies, plans, yes. yeah. prints, Exotica. all these people to show up, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and, and a few other things besides. But I think what is really interesting about the Liga, and it was just as you were commenting um, on that, uh, was she makes the shift. And is it not, because she's working with a cubist, Yes. The end of the 20s, and where does collage take a radical shift? It is under the collage process of the Cubists of the yes. in 1912 <coughs> or 1912. Yes. And yes. I wonder yes. whether she's making that, some of that parallel mm -hmm. and seeing that the collage has, mm -hmm. it has the potential for allowing her to pin up everything she wants to pin up, but it also has a kind of creative dimension to it. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, very interesting. Well, thank you ever so much, Louise. That was for such a rich and <laughs>